In college, Noah was unstoppable. He was captain of the football team, a straight-A student, and well on his way to medical school. He was my friend and classmate. But one day, without warning, Noah's bright young life was cut short, not by a visible enemy, but by a silent killer. Suicide, it's a word we often avoid, a topic we hesitate to discuss, yet it's claiming the lives of our young people at an alarming rate. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among youth aged 10 to 14 and young adults aged 25 to 34. And through conversations I've been having over the past few days and surely will have tonight, it's a reality that touches everyone in this room either directly or a degree or two removed. The problem is there's no early warning system or science-based tool to detect those at risk. Many young people don't talk about their struggles and researchers are hesitant to ask. We can't predict who is suffering in silence and we lack effective ways to foresee future attempts or provide the right interventions. While fleeting thoughts are common, the absence of clear indicators leaves us powerless. We do have science-based tools to detect certain types of cancer early on, which is the third leading cause of death among young people. But for suicide, the second leading cause of death, we have nothing like that. The field of psychiatric risk biomarkers has fallen far behind other areas of medicine. And the problem goes deeper. NIH funding lags far behind and research is still in its infancy. Another issue is we don't have effective treatments designed for suicide. Yes, we have things like psychotherapy and safety planning, but those things only yield small effects. And some antidepressant medications can reduce suicidal thoughts in some people, but they don't work for everyone and we lack effective treatments specifically designed to address suicide. Well, why is that? Well, part of the problem is we don't understand really what causes suicide. Neuroimaging tells us there are differences in how the prefrontal cortex, the area right behind your forehead, responds to and regulates stress, but that doesn't tell us why those differences exist. And much of the work in adults is done in adults, leaving children and adolescents, often the most vulnerable, overlooked. A lot of times we adapt treatments for adults and we expect them to work the same for kids, but as anyone who's been around kids knows, their brains and bodies aren't just smaller versions of our own. And as a developmental neuroscientist, I can tell you it's an entirely different system. That's why, with generous support from One Mind and the Manana Lovelace family, we're launching the Serenity Study, an innovative approach to address these gaps. We're exploring a new potential biomarker that, if successful, could identify those at risk. We're also looking into what drives suicidal thoughts and behaviors, allowing us to develop new targeted treatments and interventions. My research focuses on the endocannabinoid system as a potential biomarker. Although the system was named because cannabis comp components of cannabis like THC bind to it, that's not what we're studying here. That's a totally different talk I could give later on if you're interested. Instead, we're studying the body's own natural cannabinoid system the, the, and their receptors, which can be found throughout the brain, as shown in this PET imaging scan. Warmer colors indicate areas of greater receptor density. And what you can see right off the bat is that cannabinoid receptors are found throughout the brain. They're actually the most prominent, even more so than things like serotonin and dopamine, which we'll hear about in a little bit. The endocannabinoid system is really exciting because it's relatively new to modern medicine. It was actually discovered within the past 50 years, and it plays a critical role in brain development, emotion regulation, and stress responding. And the endocannabinoid system is implicated in psychiatric risk in adults and also suicide risk, but it's never before been studied in youth. This is critical because adolescence is a significant period of biological and brain development and a recalibration of the body's stress response systems. It's also a period that we call storm and stress. The endocannabinoid system is especially interesting because we have new ways to target it pharmacologically in adults or behaviorally in my lab through things like exercise, meditation, or even hypoxia, which could be achieved through high altitude hiking or even in a chamber. And this research is possible thanks to new approaches which would take years or even decades to achieve through pharmaceutical companies. No offense, Sumit. <laughs> 
behavioral approaches are even slower. So what will we do? We'll study 30 youth with clinically significant suicidal thoughts and behaviors and 30 without. Youth will be recruited from Detroit, um, from our partner Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Clinic with close collaboration from our Child and Adolescent Psychiatrist to ensure the highest level of safety during and after study participation. Youth and a parent or legal guardian will complete two study visits with us consecutively. On the first visit, youth will complete a laboratory-based stress task, kind of what I'm doing right now, actually a public speaking task, during which we'll collect blood samples to quantify endocannabinoid concentrations using liquid chromatography mass spec or LCMS. On the second visit, youth will complete a one-hour MRI scan during which we'll measure brain structure and function during an emotion regulation task, again with close focus on the prefrontal cortex for its critical role in emotion regulation and stress responding. And for hypotheses, we predict that higher endocannabinoid concentrations whoops, will be associated with greater suicidal thoughts and prefrontal cortex dysregulation. Beyond providing the first proof of concept study linking the cannabinoid system to suicide risk in adolescents, we've got our eyes on interventions, behaviorally in my lab, and also we're closely watching the growing number of pharmacological studies in adults treating things like anxiety, depression, and PTSD. But again, as is often the case, youth are often the last to benefit from these important scientific advances. So you might be thinking, what can you all do? Well, by being here and supporting the research, that is a huge contribution. But there's something that we can all do every day in our own lives, and that's talk about suicide, mental health, and addiction, check in on loved ones frequently, and for those in immediate need, call or text 988. Silence perpetuates stigma, but by speaking out as each and every one of you I know do in your own lives, we can break it. My graduate student, Sam, gave me the courage to pursue this line of work with her. I want to shout out to my students and team at the Think Lab, whose passion and dedication inspired me to launch the Brainstem podcast, where we invite those with lived experiences to talk about what it's like in their own words and share evidence-based information about the brain. So if we succeed with this research, we could have a tool to identify at-risk youth, like Noah, when they can't or they won't speak out. Imagine a future where a standard blood test could flag someone at risk, allowing us to intervene before it's too late. This research would also be a scientific breakthrough in mechanisms, or what causes suicidal thoughts in young people, paving the way for new targeted treatments and interventions. I want to thank you all so much for believing in myself and my team, and sharing my vision of reducing suffering in young people. Thank you.